What's up guys, Mason the Brock Anderson here, and what a great game, or at least that's what I heard. So yeah, as the title of this video says, it's going to start off with a bit of a little bit of a rant. Because frankly, this is the second time this year I've already had to have this rant, because NBCSN is stupid. And I, I, don't, I don't get it at all. You know, the first time this happened, first time I had to listen to the game on Chelsea TV, you know, listen to some of the guys just talk about the game and not actually get to see it, it was because there were two other games going on. One was, I think it was Tottenham that was playing at the time, and they were playing somebody who was actually, it was setting up to be possibly a pretty good game. And then the other one was Arsenal Crystal Palace, which at the time, it was kind of a big story because Arsenal were looking terrible and... Palace hadn't won or even scored a goal, so it was like, how long could this go on? So that one had more of a story, but the truth is, Chelsea had just as much of a story. They were away from home, Arsenal was at home, so pretty sure Arsenal's going to get the win there, especially against Crystal Palace. Um, but Chelsea were away from home, and they were playing against Leicester, so reigning champions versus former champions, which one's probably going to be a better game? The Chelsea-Leicester game. But no, they skip over that one. They say, all right, you can pay 50 bucks if you want to watch it. We're going to show these other two games that probably aren't going to be as good. So then we get to today. And I'm thinking, okay, it's not on TV. What are they showing? There are three games on with possible title contenders. You've got Man City versus um, Leicester at Leicester. Good game. You know, Man City looking really good. Of course, a lot of people probably want to watch them. So, you know, fine, you want to show that one. You've got Liverpool versus Southampton. Okay, well, that could be kind of interesting. You know, Liverpool sold a lot of players to Southampton in the past. And you got Chelsea at West Brom. Okay, well, that's where Chelsea won the title last season. West Brom, typically a tough team to play against. On top of that, they're really struggling right now, so probably last chance for Tony Peels to get him in line. So what do they do? They show one game out of the three. You've got three channels to work with. You've got... Actually, no, you've got four, because I've seen them shown on MSNBC as well. So you've got NBCSN, you've got CNBC, MSNBC, or NBC. You could show any of these games on, and you choose to show one game. And what's frustrating about this is, is that they expect us to have to pay more money than we're already paying the cable provider because we want to watch these games. And they're handcuffing us because we've got no other options. I can't go watch the game somewhere else. I might be able to legally stream it, but I don't know where to find those websites. I'm not, I don't normally illegally stream stuff, so I'm not used to that. So I can't find any other place to watch this game, except I have to pay 50 extra dollars to NBCSN to be able to watch two games so far. And what's really frustrating about all this is, is that it makes sense that the top teams are going to be shown on TV more often because those are the more interesting games. You know, once you get down the line near the end of the season, the relegation battle becomes more interesting and they'll probably be shown a lot more. But right now, the most interesting ones are the teams that are the best because you want to watch attractive, entertaining soccer, football, whatever you want to call it. That's where you find it. Is you watch the top teams. So you want to watch your, your Man Cities, your Man U's, your Chelsea's, your Liverpool's, your Tottenham's, your Arsenal's. You want to watch those games. And so they're saying, well, you can, but you have to pay extra. But it's only for like one or two weekends. At least for Chelsea, it's been two so far. I don't. I can't remember if Tottenham's had to, any Tottenham fans have had to pay yet. Um, I know Man City's had to pay once. I don't think Man U has, which makes sense because Chevy funds Man U. They sponsor Man U and MB, MSNBC or whatever. So yeah, of course, because Chevy is behind both of you. Of course, Man U hasn't had to pay yet because all of their games have been on TV so far. And so it's just, it's stupid. It's stupid to force us to have to pay more when, frankly, you're probably only going to watch like two or three games on the app all season. I'm going to have to pay 50 bucks to watch three games. That's not cost effective. And especially because I'm broke right now, I don't have the money to pay for that. So I have no, ga no way to watch the game. I have to watch the highlights, and that's frustrating. Because I want to see how my team is playing. I want to see if we played well, if it was a great performance from us, or was it a terrible performance from West Brom. I want to see that, but I can't now. Because you've handcuffed me, and you've made it to where I can't watch the game at all. Because I've got no options other than paying 50 bucks, which I don't have. And that's what's stupid about it. 
if you want, okay, if the if the sponsorships are not coming in, if maybe you're not making as much money from your your sponsors as as before, okay, you know I understand if you need more money, that's fine, but make it more cost effective. Make it a weekly payment. Make it to where okay, I want to tune in this week. I'll pay two dollars and I'll watch all the games that I want this weekend. But this weekend, Chelsea's not on the app, so I'm not going to pay. Oh, next week they're not either? I'm not going to pay that week. So now you've got some people who maybe if they want to watch every single game, they'll pay $2 every single weekend. And now you're making a ton of money off of them. you got some people who want to watch maybe some of the mid-table sides, and they'll pay probably about half of the games this season because you know half of them will be on TV, half of them won't. The top teams, they'll only pay for like a few weeks because only a few of the games won't be shown on TV. So now you've got a little bit of a, a curve. You've got the people who are desperate to watch every game, they'll be willing to pay every week. But those of us that just want to watch one team and enjoy our team playing, we'll pay the weeks whenever they're not on TV. We'll pay that $2. Maybe it'll amount to about $10 over the season. I can do that. I can't do 50 for what will probably be three or four games all season. So, yeah, I had to go on a little bit of a rant because, frankly, I find it infuriating that that's what they're going to now. That they are just, they're sticking to it. They're not changing up anything. They're not trying to at least show the top teams playing by opening up a couple of their networks. They're just like, no, we're going to make sure that some of these people who watch the top teams, they have to pay. We're going to make sure that happens because we're going to stop showing some of their, at some point I feel like it's just going to be like, you know what, we're going to use this time now on NBCSN to, to show you something completely different and you're gonna to have to go to the app to watch all of the games and then they're gonna handcuff us entirely and I'm just like that's stupid it's stupid of you to do it's it's selfish it's greedy and it just shows that businesses in America are selfish and greedy you know and a lot of people already know that a lot of people already think about that but NBCSN is just proven it by doing this to us and so I guess now time to talk about some of the game, you know, I was able to see the highlights of the goals. I'm hoping maybe they'll put up the full highlights later. I can't find them now um, to see, you know, obviously I heard about a lot of what was going on, you know, some of the, the decisions from the referee, some of the chances. I did hear some of this, but most of it is through the eyes of these Chelsea, former Chelsea players, I think, or coaches. So I don't know if this is their biased opinion or if this is actually what they're seeing. So I can't really formulate my own opinion on this, so I'm just going to talk about some of what I saw, at least. Um, first of all, talk about the lineup, because it's another good lineup. Uh, same exact lineup that we had against Man U, and I love it. You know, I love the fact that Christensen is still getting to play. I love the fact that Zepacosta is getting to play as well, because that means that Spilicueta is in the back three. Even though I still think Rudiger deserves to start over Cahill, I think for right now, as long as you've got Christensen and Spilicueta in, Cahill's not a problem. And hopefully, you know, Rudiger does get to play in midweek against Karabag because, you know, we're going to need everybody to be fresh for next week in, uh, weekend against Liverpool. Um, but, yeah, having the, the midfield three of Bakayoko, Conte, and Fabregas has been very strong. And it's worked wonders again today. You know, I heard a lot of Bakayoko making great challenges and being strong. I heard a lot of, obviously, Conte making great challenges. I heard a lot of good things from Fabregas as far as his passing, you know, opening up the play a lot. So I think those three work really well together. Um, it is kind of a, a wonder of what happens when one of them gets injured or who do you take out first or who do you put in? You know, Do you switch it up and make it back to a 3-4-3 three, three again or do you stick with this 3-5-2? So I'll be interested to see what happens when we have to change this up a little bit. But for right now, I think this midfield three is working out very well. Um, then you've got you know the, the front two of Hazard and Murata I think is very very effective right now. Not just not just uh, Hazard and Murata. I think having Hazard up there is almost like a secondary striker. I think is very effective. You know, I saw it happen um what was it? I think it was last year whenever they came to the US, they sort of did it whenever they played Real Madrid, the game I I went to personally go see. They did that with Hazard and Batshuayi and then as soon as he came into the game, they just started, you know, they put away two goals and they looked much more dangerous because Hazard can do that. I think he can play that position very well of being a secondary striker, making runs off the main striker, and also setting up play with him as well. So um, the other thing that I heard quite a bit was you know the continuation of what we saw against Man U two weeks ago, which was 
one of the midfield three sort of stepping up in the attack. At first it was Fabregas, but then Bakayoko started doing it again, which is something he did really well against Man U. So I, I also like the formation because it allows for that. It allows for one of either Fabregas or Bakayoko to step up. Uh, Fabregas is very good, you know, moving the ball around, combining with Hazard and Murata. Bakayoko is just very big and strong and very good at drawing players to him. So, yeah, it's a formation that works really well right now. So I guess let's get into sort of some of what I've heard of uh, as far as the performances. Courtois, you know, didn't have a whole lot to do from what I understand. There was one uh, chance at goal that West Brom had early on that was ruled off sides, and they said that Courtois really should have done better to get his hand down to it or something. Um, once again, you know, couldn't see it, so I don't really know, but it does sort of play into that thought that I've had of Courtois being more than just a good keeper, but being a a world-class keeper, you know, a keeper that's going to make the impossible saves, the ones that you're just like, holy cow, how did he do that? How did he keep them in the game? He hasn't really been making those saves as much, so I don't know, you know, if he had anything else to do during the game, but, you know, that was one that just, when they said it, that's what I thought of. It instantly made me think of what I've been saying about him over the past few weeks. Um... Cahill, I heard a lot of good things about, you know, whether I would have liked his performance or not, I don't know, because frankly, it's more what he does off the ball that frustrates me. Uh, I do know there were a couple of chances that West Brom had, and I don't know if Cahill was involved in those chances or if it was, you know, just the whole defense, but uh, one of them particularly was, uh, what's his name, Matty Phillips. Matty Phillips on the on our left side. Sounded like he was doing some damage, you know, getting past Alonzo with pace, and it sounded like Cahill, sort of typical of Cahill, wasn't stepping out to close down. He was more just in the space there. And so it's like, it's fine if he's going to run at you, but there are certain players, like Phillips did today, and a couple other players that do this a lot that have hurt us in the past. Um, one in particular is Erickson. Does a very good job of cutting in and then looking to cross instead of driving. Uh, Dav- David Silva is very good at doing that. Um... I'd say kind of Sanchez, depending on where he is on the field. But players like that have hurt us in the past because they get past Alonzo and Cahill's in the space like, all right, come at me, I'm going to stop you. And there's like, no, I'm going to sit in this space and then deliver a brilliant cross because you're giving me the space to do it. And that's what sounded like happened. You know, Phillips gets past Alonzo. Cahill doesn't go to close him down. He just stands there and waits for him to come to him. Cross comes in, Rondon thankfully is off sides, but it could have been a goal. And it comes from that side, because that's the dangerous side for us. That's the one that, you know, Alonzo doesn't have the pace to keep up with the guy, and then Cahill's not stepping out to close him. It's dangerous there. So that's just, you know, obviously I can't say for sure, because I didn't actually see it, but that's just what it sounded like to me. Um, Then we get to Christensen in the middle, heard a lot of good things about him defensively. And on the ball, you know, they kept talking about how calm he looked, how cool and collected. And that's something I've really noticed about him. He looks very confident, you know, even though he's a young defender, he's very confident on the ball. So I love having a defender back that back there like that. Uh, Spilly Cueta, they kept saying that he was doing a really good job, you know, defensively shutting it down. So sounds a bit more like the Spilly Cueta we've come to know and love. Uh, Zappacosta heard some good things about on the attack. Uh, and defensively, he had some good moments late on in the game as well. But mainly it was... The attack, it felt like he, they were constantly saying his name whenever he, we get into the attack. Like, he was up there. He was threatening. So, I think that's something that Zappacosta brings that I know Moses brings as well, but I think Zappacosta brings it in a little bit more of a, a knowledgeable sense. Moses is very quick. So, he's able to get up and down the line very fast, and if we break out, he's generally the one that we send it to because he's got the speed. Zappacosta sounds more like we get it down the field, and he's actually getting in the box and helping out. Whereas Moses is a bit more of a winger who is going to come in or come out and then come back in, um, almost like William does. So I don't know. It's different having Zappacosta out there, but I think in a game like this, where it's a little bit less of a counterattacking game for us and more of a we're getting people forward and we're attacking, I think Zappacosta probably works a bit better in a game like this where we're swinging the ball side to side. Um, Alonzo. You know, obviously he got the goal, and of course it's the week after I switched him out for Spilly Cueto on my fantasy team because 
you know, Alonzo gets two goals against Tottenham, so I put him in over Spilicueta. The next six weeks, Spilicueta gets like six assists, and I'm just like, oh, okay, I'll put him back in this week. And then, you know, doesn't get an assist or a goal, and Alonzo scores, because that's just how my fantasy team works. <laughs> it's just my luck. Um, but yeah, so he got the goal. It's a very, very nice finish. Uh, but as far as how he did overall, I didn't really hear his name mentioned a lot. You know, I heard the ball get switched out to him a lot of the time, so he was providing the width for us. But I just don't know how effective he was on the ball or even defensively. Uh, I do know, like I said, Phillips seemed to get past him quite a few times early on. So, you know, it, it's one of those things where I'd, I'd have to see how he did to really tell, but it sounds like he did average. You know, he had some good moments, he had some poor moments, but overall he didn't really hurt us. So, uh, into the midfield, Conte obviously sounded like he was being a beast in there again. You know, just constantly shutting down the play, uh, making sure they don't have any attack, and then providing good uh, distribution as well. Bakayoko, like I said, sounded like he was being a monster in there, just really doing a good job of holding up the ball, putting in some strong challenges. And Fabregas, as I said, uh, very good with the distribution and setting up good attacks. Uh, I did see the one pass... To, obviously, he got two assists today, so that was really good. Uh, but the pass to Hazard for the third or for the fourth one, uh, the pass to Murata that he flicked it onto Hazard, is just very, very good to see him providing those dangerous attacking balls like he used to. You know, it's something that has kind of dropped out of his game a little bit. Um, so it's nice to see him getting back into that. Every single time he's on the ball, you feel like something's about to happen because it's been a little bit off this season. Then you got the two front men in Hazard and Murata. Um, Hazard it sounded like he was just he was fired fired up today. Uh, they said that Barry went in on a, a hard challenge on him at one point, and he got really pissed off by it. And next thing you know, he's just flying everywhere. He's taking the ball, uh, turns Barry, and then has a drill of a shot you know, that leads to the first goal. And then the next thing you know, he's going in a dangerous challenge on uh, one of the midfielders for West Brom. So it sounded like that early challenge really got him fired up to play. And this is what happens when he's fired up to play. When he is there and just working hard, he is a dangerous, dangerous player. And we know this. Uh, but it's nice to see that he's back to the Hazard that we know and the Hazard that we remember from beginning of last season. Because... You know, his performances since coming back from the in injury have been good, but they haven't been phenomenal. You know, they haven't been world class. This is back to world class again. You know, this is always dangerous. Every single time he gets on the ball, there's something about to happen. It's great to see. Uh, and then you got Murata, who also looked very deadly today. You know, had a great game against Man U, I thought, and today sounded like another good game. You know, gets a goal after picking up Hazard's crap, scraps, and then brilliant, brilliant flick on for the assist for Hazard's goal. So, I mean, it just sounded like he was a constant threat up there. He was working hard, causing problems for the defense, and that's what you want from your forward, you know, especially because Batshuayi is now out injured for who knows how long. You want to make sure that Murata is 100% and raring to go and just willing to put in a strong challenge, and he did. So, very good to see. Um, the final three people to talk about were the subs. Uh, Drinkwater comes on for Fabregas. Didn't really hear his name a lot, but, you know. It, honestly, all three of these subs, I can't really talk about the performance, but what I do want to talk about is it was Drinkwater, Pedro, and then William came on for Fabregas, Hazard, and then Conte. The thing about it is, when William came on, I understand you want to get him some time because, frankly, this formation's been working really well. You're probably not going to use Pedro or William that often because they don't really fit into any sort of point on the field you know they're normally playing in behind the striker but since you've only got one person now in behind the striker it's got to be Hazard so unless you want to try to slot in William or Pedro into one of the wingback roles most likely they're not going to see a lot of time so I get you want to get them both on the field but think about the fact that you've got probably one of your younger players on the bench who has been everybody's been talking about him he just got his first international start for for Wales what a be what better time to put him on the field in his first Premier League outing than when you're four nothing up against West Brom, you know it, that would have been perfect. He would have gotten out there, probably had some good confidence, you know, pr 
pressure wouldn't have been that high because at the point at that point it sounded like West Brom had just sort of, you know, whatever. Let's just try not to concede anymore. It would have been the perfect game to put him out there and just give him a bit of confidence. But they decided to go William and Pedro. I'm just like, I don't know. I why couldn't you give him a shot? Why couldn't you let the youngster get out there and sort of show what he's capable of? Because this is the perfect game to do it. So I don't know. I was a little bit disappointed by that, but aside from that, you know, the rest of this game. It sounded really great. Um, I just hate the fact that it sounded great and it didn't look great. So, anyway, that's about it for me. Uh, let me know what you guys think down in the comment section below. If you're a fellow USA Chelsea fan, please let me know. You know, do you feel the same way that I do? Probably do. Um, but yeah, let me know how you feel about NBCSN, the whole gold package, and you know, let me know how you feel about the game as well. So leave a like and subscribe for future Chelsea reviews. See you guys in the next one. Hopefully, I'll be able to watch that one. Peace out.